workers who's putting this on and I wanted to say welcome I'm the food committee and <laughs> the food committee is a way of dem uh, has found a way to demonstrate income inequality random inequality you don't get to choose your gender your color the country where you're born and sometimes those things work to your advantage or disadvantage in a random way and so choosing a red ticket or a blue ticket is another way of experiencing random inequality. Some of you had a feast of saltine crackers, and others could have your choice of sandwiches, fruit, cookies, beverages, and, um, ah, and here's more coffee. Now, as promised, we will have redistribution of wealth now, because this is the way we want the world to be. And so, regardless of the color ticket you have, at any point, you're welcome to go to the red table, get some juice, some fresh coffee, fruit, vegetables, cookies, chocolate, whatever you like, because now you're all rich. <laughs> Now I'll just step aside and let the, the true program begin. All right, so welcome to the Income Inequality Forum hosted by Occupy Edmonton. My name is Roshni Nair, and I'm an associate news producer for CJSR 88.5, Edmonton's community radio. Today we hope this forum will shed light on the growing gap between rich and poor. Before I begin with my introductions of our panel speakers, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory. Hi, hi. I would like to thank the organizers of this forum, Occupy Edmonton. Occupy Edmonton is a social justice organization dedicated to strengthening Edmonton through horizontal direct action and participatory frameworks like this one. They focus particularly around combating the effect of corporate interests on our political and public institutions. Thank you for putting this forum together. I would like to thank each of our panel speakers for being here and the Stanley A. Milner Library for hosting us this afternoon. And finally, thank you to the community for your interest and participation in this forum. So today we'll be hearing from four guest speakers, each of whom will speak for 15 minutes and after each uh, presentation, there'll be five minutes for questions. So first up, we have Helen McFadden. So Helen has spent many years as a grassroots advocate, spokesperson, and consultant in the field of inclusion, rights, accessibility, and social supports for persons with disabilities. She's a strong proponent of Canada's social determinants of health, so things like income, social status, support, etc. Helen is a Unitarian Universalist candidate minister, currently working as chaplain and spiritual care director at St. Thomas Health Center in Edmonton. She holds a Master of Divinity from the Atlantic School of Theology and is currently a doctoral candidate at St. Stephen's College at the University of Alberta. Please welcome Helen. My personal interest in um, disability was certainly peaked when about maybe 15 or 20 years ago I began to have trouble with my vision and um, so I've been legally blind for 15 years or more and uh, it, it kind of kick-started my interest in uh, the advocacy, the self-advocacy movement. I had a lovely PowerPoint, yes, blind people do PowerPoint, but apparently we have no uh, technology available to us today, so I'm just gonna kinda wing it, be the talking head up here. So I'm gonna ask you just uh, to use your imaginations just for a minute, I want you to think. When I say the word disability, <laughs> When I say the word disability, what, what immediately comes to mind? 
I want you to shut it out. The, th the things that come to mind. Anybody? Yeah. Deafness. Deafness. Marginalized. Marginalized. Come on, you can do better. <coughs> Wheelchairs. Wheelchair. Restricted access. Restricted access. Discrimination. You're a more enlightened crowd than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> disability. Uh, I would define disability, and I think many of my colleagues in the uh, in the advocacy movement would agree that disability is a social construction relating to the physical psychological, developmental, or perceptual uniqueness of individuals. Nothing more, a social construction. It's a catch-all category that refers to people who just merely have a unique experience because of a, um, a difference, an otherness. I think what people forget often is that every uh, disability, if you will, has a broad range and spectrum of severity. Uh, so nobody's experience is the same. Disabilities can be visible or invisible, permanent or temporary or episodic. Uh, so in this regard, the Canadian government and all the kinds of support networks, uh, uh, industry, everyone has a different def definition of what disability is and who and who is not a disabled person. That said, according to the Canadian Survey on Disabilities, this was a new, uh, a new version of the PALS study on uh, limitations of daily activities, was released in 2012, and uh, it finds that 14% of our adult population identify as having a disability. Now, this, uh, this survey did not include uh, children under the age of 15, or anyone living in long-term care. And working in, in an assisted living facility, I can tell you that just about 100% of those people would probably categorize themselves as having a disability. So one in seven Canadians has a disability, a significant portion of our population. However, Canadians with disabilities are more than twice as likely to live in poverty as other Canadians. People with disabilities face exclusion and disincentives to quality education, employment, and from participation in their communities. We now have a growing population of people in Canada who are aging. By I think the estimate is that by the year 2031, we're going to be 40% of us uh, over the age of 65, and all of these people uh, risk progressive development of disabilities which require additional health services and supports. Adults with intellectual disabilities are three times more likely than non-disabled Canadians to live in poverty. Children with disabilities are twice as likely to live in households that rely on social assistance as its main source of income. Adults with intellectual disabilities are three times more likely than non-disabled Canadians to live in poverty. Bears repeating. Over 55% of working age adults with disabilities are unemployed or out of the labor market altogether. This number rises to 60% for women, 70% for adults with intellectual disabilities. So what are the challenges for people who have disabilities in this province, this city, and this country? Well, there's certainly an additional layer of bureaucracy that's needed to uh, access supports. All the kinds of special um, funding and supports that are earmarked disability often have a complicated, invasive, and dehumanizing process that's filled with red tape. I don't believe that the point is really to discourage people with disabilities from giving up, but that's in essence what results. Government and non-government uh, agencies alike all 
talk a lot about inclusion of people with disabilities, mainstreaming and so forth. But paradoxically, most often they will set up uh, separate supportive services and um, disability offices, special needs kind of um, programs. And while these do provide some necessary services, it just perpetuates and the, um, the aspect of separation and difference. Other uh, problems that people with disabilities encounter are the lack of accessible transportation. This is especially true in any ur uh, rural area or outside of any urban center. If you can't get to, uh, to your education or your community centers or to work, you're going to live in poverty. There are systemic ba barriers to education and employment. Institutions are simply unwilling at this point to meet reasonable accommodation. Reasonable accommodation is this, uh, uh, well, we'll talk about more about that later, but essentially it's an ambiguous term which, um, which is often countered with a lot of resistance in both institutions of employment, education, industry, and so forth. Another barrier are the expensive assistive equipment uh, and technology that people need. Power wheelchairs, modified vehicles, gadgets like digital recorders. I've got so many talking gadgets, it's, it's unreal. All of it is prohibitively expensive for most people. Um, it's a niche market. Um, there are some programs that support adapting homes and vehicles and so forth for people with mobility issues, but by far and large, it's, um, if, if people know about the resources, and that's, an, that's a barrier too, people don't necessarily know what's available. There's no cohesive way of supporting people who are new to disability uh, into a transition where they can remain independent. Social isolation is, is a huge one. If you can't afford to go out, if you can't enter, physically enter a building because it's, it doesn't have a ramp or a door opener or whatever, then, and you, if you, so if you can't afford these things and you can't get into the buildings, it increases your uh, sense of dependence, your sense of vulnerability, um, and it perpetuates this cycle of disability, poverty, social isolation. People fall off the radar. In my mind, the, the crux of the whole thing is um, the single biggest barrier are attitudinal barriers and ableism. These are not easily solved. Much like racial discrimination, ableism um, is an a perception that people with disabilities uh, are, are not as valuable in society. It's oftentimes a subtle form of discrimination, um, but the, it manifests itself through dehumanization. In other words, seeing people just for their disability, not recognizing the whole person. We even use the language of um, um, uh, referring to people as a schizophrenic rather than a person who has schizophrenia, or a blind person rather than a person who happens to be blind. The, um, other forms of barriers related to attitudes, dehumanizing, so denying the uniqueness, the uniqueness the, uh, and making assumptions about people that, for example, that all people with disabilities or of a particular group of disabilities are only interested in working in, uh, with people with disabilities. And nothing could be farther from the truth or that we should all live together or other uh, assumptions like this. Disempowering, imposing help, able-bodied people, well-meaning, I suppose, but uh, creating, designing programs and services that really do not me meet the needs of people with disabilities. Oftentimes, we're not even asked. The use of oppressive language that equates disability with illness or illness with being bad or inferior. 
overprotecting and oftentimes we are held to lower standard and when we do have employment we're given menial labor or tasks simple tasks I am probably an anomaly really I am one of the few people in this country who is legally blind and has a master's degree I m imagine there's probably a couple dozen of us I don't know but uh, it, the expectation is that we will not have employment and if we do it's going to be menial there has been the good news is there's been a move away from uh, institutionalization the residential schools we had our own residential schools for the blind for the deaf and so forth and um, we're moving away from that model. Uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was uh, an intentional treaty to promote, protect, and ensure the full enjoyment of human rights by persons with disabilities and to ensure full equality under the law. This was adopted in 2006. Canada signed up, as did a whole bunch of other countries, and we ratified it. And I think we are beginning to see the impact uh, of people claiming their rights under this international treaty. We, there are, is, of course, uh, human rights le legislation at, at the federal level, our Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. There's a whole patchwork of different kinds of uh, acts, human rights acts and accessibility, kind of the Blind Persons Rights Act and so forth, Service Dog Act, which provide a little bit of uh, support or protection in certain circumstances but but I think what we where we failed in Canada is we have not uh, sought out this the model uh, similar model to the American with Disabilities Act which is a national act uh, which is applicable to the entire country which that came out after Vietnam and so many soldiers who had been injured required uh, disability services it was a front a grassroots action this is where people started standing up saying, hey, you know, you can't treat us like this. It's not right. So advocacy groups, yes, people have pushed back. Um, the, the danger of the charity model, I think, is one of the greatest, one of the greatest barriers still. We're still attached to this charity model, this idea that uh, if you think that, that people with disabilities have good supports, are well taken care of, and so forth, you're wrong. That's a myth. We live in poverty for the most part. And there's this illusion that these disability organizations, I'll just name a couple, CNIB, Paraplegic Association, these kinds of national nonprofit charities, uh, have a role to play. They, they have had historically a role to play in teaching skills and so forth. But they are not the be all and end all. And there's to make the assumption that these people are providing for people with disabilities is wrong. They Oftentimes, the people, the grassroots people, are rejecting them because they serve to perpetuate the stigma of dependence, this model of dependence on charity, the charity model. So, what are the goals if we're going to change this? If we're going to turn this around, what are the goals? Well, I think we need to change social attitudes about disability. We, we must reflect a new inclusive model that empowers people. Um, we need affordable access to universal uh, design. Uh, so universal design is basically is considers that every building, every piece of technology, every piece of everything, anything that programs, it's a, the philosophy that it would be open and accessible by the most number of people. We have the capability to do this. When I pick up a cell phone, at the store, I should be able to use it. There's no reason that, we, we, that I cannot be able to use it. But because we do not have, we have not bought into the idea that we're going to make things fully accessible to the most number of people, um, that's not the case. I hear my bell. Uh, if I may. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mine would be t talking in a British accent and just tell me to hurry up. I'm just gonna beg your indulgence for a couple more minutes. The Council of Canadians with Disabilities is calling for enhanced disability supports and that the federal government play a role in alleviating poverty for persons with disabilities by taking some ownership and maybe freeing up some of that provincial money for doing provincial things, that there be a labor force inclusion measure. 
and that we um, develop a national strategy and a develop a role to promote accessibility and community inclusion. So there are uh, indeed uh, we need more accessible transportation, more more equitable and streamlined process for uh, accessing government services and so forth. Um, th there's movement. There's good movement. Um, We've had in recent years the disability tax credit and the disability savings plan. There's a whole hodgepodge of little things. I think what we need to see is a more streamlined process to not create barriers for people to apply for these or, or to know that they're there. The disability tax credit needs to be uh, refundable to people who are, who are uh, living in poverty, especially families of children with intellectual disabilities, the majority of which are living on assistance. That should be a refundable credit, not just, you know, what good is a tax credit if you don't have a job, <laughs> really. So, uh, we have lots of remarkable technology and so forth, and um, I think what we really need to see is, is to shift ideas around, uh, to get the perception that people with disabilities are different than you. They're not, this is a social construction, folks. The only thing that's different about me from you, from you, I, I assume, I don't know about you, <laughs> excuse me, but is, is that my vision is a little bit different. So what does that mean? Does that mean that I should not have access to education or that I should um, struggle to get employment or that I be denied access you know, when a cab driver doesn't want to pick me up in Edmonton? There's a lot of work to do, but I think it begins with um, having the dialogue and really uh, seeing a national strategy develop to uh, address this as a, as a, with a unified voice as one country. speaker will be Janet Keeping. So Janet is the leader of the Green Party of Alberta. She obtained a BSc from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In 1973 she moved to Calgary where she took her master's in philosophy and then a law degree at the University of Calgary. Among her many accomplishments as a lawyer, including co-founding the Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center, Janet has specifically worked in the area of human rights environmental protection and accommodation of Aboriginal interests in the context of oil and gas development. She has a long-term commitment to human-friendly and healthy environments, social justice and democracy. Thanks very much to the organizers of this event. I was delighted to be asked to be here today. Um, income inequality is something that I've thought a lot about and worried a lot about um, while I was the, during the years that I was president of the Sheldon Schumer Foundation for Ethics and Leadership in Calgary we did a bit of work just speak, got our toes in the water um, and I've watched the issue for a long time uh, we know that inequality income inequality is growing in Canada it was a significant issue before, but it becomes an ever more significant issue. And I thought what I would just uh, uh, talk a bit about today is how I see it in democratic theory terms and in democratic practice terms. Because I think that at the end of the day, a significant income inequality as we have in Canada today is a threat to our very democracy. And without a healthy democracy, we're unlikely to solve very many of our, of, of our problems, uh, including income inequality, of course, but the, but the vast array of other problems that our society um, faces. I think that income inequality is, a, is an, a huge issue for in any democracy. I mean, that, I've been thinking a lot about this recently, that the essence of a democracy is that we're all of equal moral worth. Some of us are shorter and older, and some of you are taller and younger, and so on and so on. We differ in a vast number of different ways. But the theory behind democracy, one person, one vote, uh, that the people should, should rule themselves, is that we're equal in moral worth 
Our dreams are equally valuable. Our aspirations are equally valuable. We're, we should be equally important in the eyes of society and the institutions that we create to govern ourselves. If you combine that democratic goal, that democratic ideal, with the fact that a great deal in our society, um, you, have to pay, you have to have money to access a great deal in our society. Not absolutely every single thing, but a great deal. So if you combine what I think is a really wonderful insight and a really important goal that we're, we should, our institutions, public institutions, our society should reflect that we're equally morally important um, with the fact that access to the good things of life, even the necessities of life, is for the most part limited by how much money you have, how much income you have, you see that we've got a contradiction, right? So it's not just a social issue, it's not just, as if it weren't just <laughs> uh, important, it's not just a, a, a problem of, of social injustice, which it is, it's a moral problem, it is, but it's also, also, I think, presents a real threat to democracy. It's first a contradiction, it's just a direct contradiction in my view. And if you look at the fact that the problem's getting worse and worse and worse, it means that society is more and more fragmented. I mean, we can talk in simplistic terms like the haves and the have-nots, or the 10%, the 90%. It doesn't matter how you sort of break us down. We're becoming more fragmented along wealth lines, income lines, as well as some other lines, that we actually risk losing the sense of there being a public, that we, we lose if we haven't lost it already, that sense that there is something we share in common, which founds this whole exercise of public debate, public discussion, the sharing of ideas about how we, the public, should be governing ourselves. So I hope that doesn't sound too abstruse or sort of vague, but the whole idea of democracy is that we're of equal moral worth, that we're self-governing, that means we have to come together as community and make these decisions about we're gonna govern ourselves. We have to have some sense of reciprocity and mutual understanding and I think that that's being significantly undermined by this growing gap between rich and poor. Now, I live in Calgary, and I've lived in Calgary for a very long time. And Calgary may be a spectacular, spectacularly good, or depending, you could say bad, <coughs> example of the following. But Calgary looks like such a shiny, affluent place, you know? And there is tons of money, right, on the part of a lot of people. But there is a huge gap huge gap in Calgary. In fact, I recently saw that Calgary is one of the cities in Canada with the greatest gap between rich and poor. I thought it was the greatest, and Rich Ricardo probably knows, but even if it's not got the worst problem in this regard, it's an extremely significant gap between rich and poor, and yet there are very, very many Calgarians, and I know we're here to talk you know, at a broader level than just our own cities, but there's many Calgarians who simply, if you engage them in this discussion that you're here today to talk about, they actually can't believe it. They can't believe it they, because what their eyes tell them, what they see is something completely different. You go from your shiny new suburb and your heated garage and you drive along this fast road and you drive into the heated garage under your shiny new office building and that's how you spend your life for the most part. It's, the poverty is well disguised for the most part and it is there in spades. It is a consistent and this doesn't differ probably too much from many other Canadian cities, but we have plus 10% of the population that regularly uses the food bank. And I can tell you that a lot of Calgarians don't know that and wouldn't believe it if they heard that statement made. So I think that one of the challenges we have as people who are aware of the problem and deeply concerned about the problem is making it cogent for people. I mean, it's one thing to hear the statistics, but if you're not already kind of got your antennae out or it's not something you've turned your mind to and really thought about, I'm not sure that the bare statistics change too many people's minds. You would hope they would because they're pretty shocking statistics. But I'm not sure that they, they do often enough. And so a challenge for all of us, and I don't have an answer to this, but I mean a challenge to all of this is, is making what this means on the ground as lived lives cogent to people. What is it that people with less money don't get to do? Well, I mean one thing we know is they don't get to go to the dentist, for example. Right? You think about the fancy stuff, about fancy vacations and stuff, well of course not. But I think that, that, that there has to be much more done 
and I don't know, again, I'm, I'm not the kind of person with the expertise who knows how to, how to sort of come up with such campaigns, but to make it real for people, make, make it so that they can feel what's being lost and how gross the unfairness is. Um, so I do see, I do see um, income inequality as actually morally serious, absolutely, social injustice writ large, and also actually a threat to democracy. Um, I was invited here as leader of the Green Party, so it's a real treat to be able to just say a few Green Party-ish things to you, not trying to turn it into too partisan. Many people think that the Green Party is a one, you know, one trick pony. It's all about the environment and, and that's it. And uh, that's not true. If you actually look at the Global Green Charter, um, one of the six green principles is social justice. So this isn't um, a weird thing for a, a Green Party person to be talking about a matter of social injustice. Another thing, and it's something I think that Elizabeth May at the federal level is very good on as a green politician, is the integrity of democracy. And I've just said that I see growing uh, income inequality as a real threat in that regard. So for Greens, um, income inequality is as serious as it could possibly, as it could possibly be, actually. So um, I'm just going to wrap up these brief remarks and look forward to question and answer period. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> Our next speaker is Ricardo Acuna. Ricardo is the executive director of the Parkland Institute at the University of Alberta, a position he has held since May 2002. The Parkland Institute studies economic, social, cultural, and political issues facing Albertans and Canadians using the perspective of political economy. Ricardo has a degree in political science and history from the University of Alberta and over 20 years experience as a volunteer, staffer, and consultant for various non-government and non-profit organizations around the province. You might also recognize him from his regular column on public policy issues in VIEW Weekly. Welcome, Ricardo. Thank you. This is great, what a fabulous turnout. I'm really, really happy to be invited here today and really thrilled with the number of you that actually came out to have this conversation. And um, as the speakers before me have said, it's, it's a critically important conversation. For some time now, um, our politicians, our leaders, have been trying to focus the conversation around poverty and poverty elimination or poverty reduction which has its value and it's important, but the conversation they seem to be ignoring is the conversation about income inequality. So they're very focused on what's going on at the bottom and largely ignoring what's going on with the rest of society. And that's a serious, serious problem. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of research to show that inequality has such an impact on society, and Janet talked about some of this. Um, there was a, a seminal book on the issue a while ago called The Spirit Level by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. And what they successfully do is they track the correlation between inequality and the impacts that it has on society. And through their book, they show that that correlation runs deep and that inequality impacts everything from life expectancy rates, infant mortality rates, obesity, uh, health and well-being, teenage pregnancy rates, homicide, bullying among children, crime rates, imprisonment rates, uh, recycling levels, pretty much anything you can imagine is impacted by inequality. The greater inequality is in any given society, the worse those indicators turn out for that society. And what they show is that it's not just about what happens at the bottom. Those indicators are not just worse for the poor in any given society, but for the society as a whole. So even the wealthy in a more unequal society have worse health outcomes than they do in more equal societies. So inequality impacts everybody in society, and it comes down, I mean, the impact on democracy is significant. So, it's an important conversation for us to have, and one that for the most part is being ignored 
in our legislatures, in our House of Commons. And this is not just exclusive to Alberta or Canada, but largely around the world. Um, as Janet said, the situation in terms of inequality is especially concerning in Alberta. We have in this province the fastest growing inequality of any other province in Canada. We are, our inequality is growing faster than it is even at the national level. And we actually have the worst inequality of anybody in Canada. So it's growing the fastest and it's currently the worst. What I want to talk a little bit about today is why that is in Alberta. Throw some numbers at you, because I think I'm legally mandated as being up here on behalf of the Parkland Institute to throw numbers at you. Um, and then maybe talk about where we should be going in Alberta to, to kind of find ways to get over this and, and start turning that uh, on a different track in this province. So, I think a good place to start, as with anything in Alberta, to talk about why we have the most unequal distribution in the province, in the country, is uh, with oil and gas, because it's Alberta, and that's a good place to start talking about anything in Alberta. Um, it'll be no surprise to you that our economy and our government revenues are ridiculously dependent, over-dependent, on oil and gas industry in this province. It's the only show in town. One third of our GDP comes directly from oil and gas. One third of government revenues, that number changes on any given year, depending what's happening with the price of oil. But on average, about a third of our provincial revenues come from oil and gas. 14% um, of our workforce provincially is directly employed by all oil and gas in the province. And when you add to that, all of the parts of our economy that are indirectly connected to oil and gas, the service industry, the transportation industry, the construction industry, all of those parts, we're talking heavy, heavy dependence. If you look at the GDP, we're probably pushing 50% of our GDP directly or indirectly related to oil and gas. We're probably looking at close to a third of all employment in the province being directly or indirectly connected to oil and gas. I do this thing when I talk to, to big groups of people and I ask, just generally, I'll do that here, how many of you have a close friend or a family member who works directly or indirectly in the oil and gas sector? That'll give you an indication, right, of how dependent we are in this province on that. So the problem with that is two things. The first is because the government has become so dependent on oil and gas instead of taxation for its revenues, it makes us susceptible to the ups and downs of what is one of the most volatile resources, commodities, on the international markets. Right? Price of oil goes up, government gets more money, we have more jobs, people get more working situations, everything happens. Right? Price of oil goes down, all of that gets reversed. The government has less money, people lose jobs, people lose homes, right? We saw, we've seen that in recent years, we saw it as well in the 80s. It's that boom and bust cycle that does a tremendous disservice to this province in terms of inequality. Because what happens in Alberta is um, when we boom, the people at the top do really, really, really well. The people at the middle do <coughs> marginally well. They improve a little bit, they don't improve tremendously. The people at the bottom lose. Because when our economy booms, when the price of oil and gas goes way up, what happens to the people at the bottom as a result of that inflation is that all of a sudden they have to pay more for rent. They have to pay more for utilities. They have to pay more for transportation. They have to pay more for food. They can't find places to live because their occupancy rates go through the roof, right? So during boom times, the people at the bottom, at the top do really well, the people at the bottom lose. They do worse because they can't afford to live in an inflated society. When the bubble bursts, the people at the top are protected and they continue to make money. They continue to get wealthier, albeit at smaller rates than during the boom period, but they continue to do better. And we've got reports out from Parkland that show all of this. The people at the bottom are the first ones to lose their jobs when they have them. So they do worse. So what happens is, despite the boom and bust cycle, on both ends of that cycle, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And that's what broadens inequality in Alberta. It's one of the things that broadens inequality. Because the top is always increasing 
the bottom is always decreasing, and the middle always seems to flatline. So that's the big problem. It's that boom and bust cycle. So that's the top and the bottom. Um, the question is, what happens to the middle in Alberta? And if we take a look at the last boom in the province, I need to keep track of my time, because once I get talking about this stuff, you can't stop me. Um, <laughs> what happened during the last boom in Alberta is that the middle class, the middle class, such as it is, um, did moderately better over the course of that boom. So their incomes improved a little bit over the course of the last boom. What that statistic doesn't show, and Andrew Coyne wrote a column uh, this past week about the middle class doing fabulously in Canada. Right? Yeah, yeah. What those statistics don't show is that the reason the middle class did moderately better in Alberta is not because their salary levels improved. The reason they did better is because all of a sudden the middle class is having to work two, three, four jobs to make end meets. You compare those stats with the number of hours worked by most workers in Alberta, and you can see the correlation. In order to maintain or improve moderately, Albertans were working harder in more hours with fewer holidays and less time off than anybody else in the country, and one of the highest rates of working hours without breaks of anybody in the world. That's why the middle class did moderately better. It's not because wealth is trickling to them, and they're doing the same thing and doing better, but because they're having to work harder just to make ends meet. And that's important to keep in mind. Um, some stats about inequality. Let's start on the national level because inequality has gotten worse nationally. Um, in Canada, and these stats are a couple of years old, but in Canada, the top 50% of earners earn 87% of the total national income. So if I were to divide this room in half, half of you would get 87% of the income there was to hand out. The other 50% of you, the other half of you would have to make due with 13% of the national income. That's a huge imbalance in this country. Um, in Alberta, over the last 28 years, the top 1% of income earners have seen their real income more than double. The top 1% saw increases in their income of $320,000. Um, the bottom 90% of Albertans only saw their income grow by $3,900. Compare that. $320,000 increase at the top for the top 1%. The bottom 90% only saw a 3,900% increase. Um, the gap's growing. In 1982, Alberta's top 1% had incomes 10 times larger than the bottom 90%. By 2010, that ratio had jumped to 18 times, where the top 1% made 18 times what the bottom 90% did. The data, as Janet alluded to, is especially shocking for Calgary, which is now the most unequal city in the country. The top 1% of Calgarians saw an increase in income of $570,000 between 1982 and 2010. That's more than half a million dollars they saw their, their income increase during that period. The bottom 90% only saw an increase in pay of $2,000 over the same 28 year period. Half a million dollars versus $2,000. That's how that gap is growing in the province. Um, the top 1% in Calgary current brings in, currently brings in 26 times what the bottom 90% did. Um, Edmonton's pretty bad too. The top saw an increase of $209,000 while the bottom was only $3,000. Not as bad as Calgary, but still pretty significant. So other jurisdictions around the world deal with this problem and the problems that come from growing inequality. And it's not just, you know, lefties that talk about the problems of inequality. The World Bank, the IMF, um, the Conference Board of Canada have all released reports saying essentially that the biggest threat to economic growth in any jurisdiction in the world today is growing inequality. It impacts economies. It impacts economic growth as well. Um, other jurisdictions deal with inequality in two ways, primarily. The first is income redistribution through fair and progressive taxation. The people at the bottom pay a lower, lower portion of their income in taxes. They get to keep more of their money. People at the top pay a higher portion of their income in taxes, and there's a scale that goes up in between. That's how we fund what we need to do, and it evens out those disparities in income. That's the first way, 
jurisdictions do it. The second way is by well-funded, fully accessible public services. They serve a redistribution function because everybody has access to the services, A, that will keep them alive and secure quality of life, and B, the very services that actually allow for some level of social mobility and income growth. Education, healthcare, social services, those kind of supports and services are things that get funded when taxes are properly funded. Those are the things that reduce inequality. In Alberta today, we've got the opposite thing going on. We've got a flat tax, flat tax that actually increases the tax burden on the middle class and lessens the tax burden on the rich. So we've got redistribution, but it's going the other way. Right? Our tax money is funneling up. At the same time, the government's focus on neoliberal austerity means that in good times and bad, the only thing they're interested in is reducing costs in healthcare and education and social services. So they're cutting those very services that will actually help to lessen inequality. So what happens is, we're not bringing in tax money, we're over-dependent on oil and gas, and we're working ideologically to cut social services. The result is growing inequality, which all of the data tells us puts more strain on social services, puts more strain on healthcare, more strain on education, more strain on everything you can imagine at the same time as we're cutting, which makes the problem far, far worse. Um, I'm going to give you a really brief example from, uh, that we've just released recently uh, at the Parkland Institute of what this looks like in terms of numbers. So we all know that the social determinants of health have an impact. We know social determinants have an impact on people's health and well-being, right? Uh, the more money you have, the better your economic and social situation, uh, the healthier you're likely to be, right? That's very well established. So if we take a look at how that works out with inequality and what one small step the government could make, one small, one big difference the government could make by making a small change to inequality. In Alberta, if you brought up the health of the lowest quintile of income earners, just to the level of the second lowest quintile. So if you improved their income, their well-being, and their health outcomes by one level, um, it would save the government $1.2 billion in healthcare spending a year. Because the people in the lowest quintile access emergency services more, they require more care, they have more hospital visits, right? Just moving them up. One income level, $1.2 billion. If you moved everybody, except for the top quintile, if you moved everybody in Alberta up one income level, our health expenditures in the province would reduce by as much as $5.7 billion a year. That's significant. Maryland opened by saying that inequality is random. In many ways, it is random. But we can't lose sight of the fact that it's also political and ideological, and it hasn't happened by accident. The government has these statistics. They know how to fix it. Progressive taxation, well-funded public services would have a huge result on our collective well-being, and it would accomplish their goal of saving money. But it's contrary to their ideology of privatizing public services, and letting the rich keep as much of their money as possible. So that's the place to start, and that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you. So our final uh, speaker for this afternoon is Ken Ward. And Ken Ward is from the Enoch Cree Nation, west of Edmonton, Alberta. Since his diagnosis in 1989, Ken has been a tireless spokesperson for the Aboriginal HIV AIDS movement in Alberta. Ken was involved in the first healing and support gatherings for persons living with HIV AIDS in the 1990s. Ken has openly shared his personal journey with HIV and has become one of the most recognizable speaker and activist on HIV in the community. He's also a former band counselor for Enoch Cree Nation, contributor for the Aboriginal national newspaper, The Wind Speaker, and has, ap has appeared in 12 national documentaries, most notably The Long Walk, produced by the National Film Board. Here is Ken Ward. Thank you, Dan 
say, if you can hear me really good, let me know. Just put your hands up. That's good, David. You can put them down. I can smell your armpits. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. And also the acknowledgement in the spirit of Papa Chase and also the territories of the Enoch Creed Nation, I welcome you. We're all here to share this land. That's the teachings from the elders that I know of. Nothing is owned but shared by our old people that we've, we've listened to. So I wanted to acknowledge as well two uh, very special people in my life, and that's uh, Jane Day Chief and her son who recently passed is Leo Deci, who initiated me and honored me way back when in 1990, my Indian name, I'll say in Cree, Keo Napesis, which means Eagle Boy. And when you're honored with a name or with an eagle feather, you're to honor it as best as you can to respect this feather, like Mr. Elijah Harper had once did with the Meech Lake Accord had brought in a sense of power, but mutual respect. And to respect that feather, it's about life. And that's what we're here about today. He is coming from the grassroots movement from the First Nations. I was born as an activist. And I'll die as an activist or an actual born warrior because I was raised between two worlds with white skin, yellow hair, blue eyes, having to fight stigma and racism, even in my childhood, in my world, and then having to face it in many, many years in the residential school and foster homes. So this is a little bit about me. How about having to face these things and what you talk about and what Occupy has also a bit a part of when we had the camp. I went there and I sat and I listened. I wanted to understand. Because as you can see, when we talk about these issues, we talk about racism, discrimination, stigma. As many years ago as one member in the parliament years ago had spoken and said, where did we go wrong as they were addressing the First Nations? An elder stood up and said quietly, you just didn't take the time to understand. Simple as that. So I honor you and by listening to you as well, I need to take that time to understand because of respect. But I bring you, like I say, from a First Nations perspective and having to be involved in this movement of HIV and AIDS, but also working in the prisons for the last 25 years in Saskatchewan and Alberta and parts of lower mainland BC, and also in the Young Offenders and Protective Safe House as a resource for our sisters, our kids who are working on the streets. I see and feel and breathe the repercussions of what's going on in today's times, but like you said, it's been happening quite a while ago, but not as strong as today. Today we're threatened as First Nations as well. Those in moccasin country because what really, I sit back and I listen and I want to analyze and see where are we going? But we're being threatened in a much more greater force that we need to rely on our cultures and our traditional <coughs> beliefs to keep us, to help survive in today's times because there is no middle class back home on the home fires. We have the rich, and we have the poor. Some of our communities are still struggling with lack of social programs. We get branded and earmarked and we say we get all this money. Well, anybody knows that when money is being distributed, even with non-for-profit agencies that I co-founded, it goes through the hierarchy until you come down you know, the National AIDS Strategy, for example, a few years ago was $2.5 million nationally to be shared amongst all the AIDS service organizations. While the people who are living in poverty are surviving on just 
free coffee and perhaps if they're lucky to have a breakfast. But these monies are being channeled through departments because we have to take a chunk of every payment. And where does it go to the real people? And it's the same thing on our reserves. We talk about employment. Well, get there's jobs everywhere for your people, especially in the oil and industry. Wonderful. That's the drawing card. We'll provide jobs for your young people. You won't have an un unemployment problem. But the problem is, we take one, but we forget the other when we talk about the environment. We're being corrupted. It's not balanced. It's not balanced. I respect the people who are getting the word out there about the environment, but yet we're being bought and sold by this word of employment, and you, you won't live in poverty. It doesn't work that way. Enoch was, for example, we had oil distributions over 30 years ago. Well, we still have overcrowding. We still have the poor and single mothers and children who are raising on just a low income. Oil money didn't get us rich. It got us poor morally as a community. And we have, for one example, a neighboring reserve, in two months, we had 15 young people who committed suicide because lack of opportunities from jobs in that one reserve. It's not equally shared. It's more of the Joneses keeping this pot of money. You see, living on the reserve life is not an easy thing. If you're not a constituent, you will be shunned and put in a lower list for housing. You will be labeled and stigmatized. If you're coming out of prison, chances are, if you don't vote for your leaders or you're not related, you're stuck in the bottom of the barrel. People who have, we have such a diverse walks of lives in our communities nowadays and we have families who are being alienated because of corruption. Money, as one elder from, used to be called Hobima, but Muskwachi says that if we get this money, we need to learn how to respect it. But when you're giving money to us in the water, money, $7,000 on special pay, and you got somebody of lower income, you don't have a clue on what to budget. You see, I always believed in hope for activists in our communities to talk about these things about human justice and on reserves. Pockets of Hope has slowly been coming on board when we talk about the bill and the Transparency Act is now being introduced to our communities. I applaud it in a sense, but that's come up, what, a year ago the bill was passed. So I asked in my own backyard, are we going to see this? Well, you know how you can play the game. Simply that only if it's funding dollars we can show our salaries. What about, let's say, if we own partnerships and other enterprises from leadership? That's our business, not yours. We're struggling. We're st struggling for human rights in our reserves. But for the nice this thing about the Charter of Human Rights has been introduced, it's now making some noise in our reserves because before it wasn't allowed to penetrate within our confines of our communities because it's, you have no right to be on our reserve. But now with this happening, with this bill, there's pockets of hope. But they say in Indian country, moccasin country, the impacts of all this injustice and human unfairness in our own communities our children resonate what is the social ills and what resonates our determinants in our communities of the neglected. But I find hope when I see someone like this and I wanted to acknowledge when I was reading this paper, The View Weekly, 
I'm doing a little promo, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I get a few bucks. So <laughs> but this young lady just sparked my fires because community social activism nowadays is so important in our communities to address our needs. We're not empowered enough to be able to know that our voice is stronger rather than going to jail or <coughs> excuse me, smoking a crack pipe or violence, domestic violence. But we need to groom and to be able to improve the quality of life is by simply speaking out. And Cindy Blackstock, who comes from the blood, I mean from the Southern Reserves, really hit it on the nail. The struggle for equality amongst First Nations children has long been a labor of love for activist Cindy Blackstock, who has dedicated her career in fighting what she says is nothing short of discrimination against Canada's most vulnerable children. After years of witnessing the underfunded governments of services available to First Nations children, helping to launch a human rights complaint eventually being placed under surveillance by the Canadian government, Black Sox says it's high time Canada puts their collective feet down and call for an end of injustice plaguing our communities. I love her. Mm -hmm. I need, we need those voices in solidarity like I don't know more that once stood up and proud. It was a younger generation who are speaking out about these things. But my fear is don't let it slide, don't be idle. We're all natural born warriors here as collective souls for a reason. And that's for equality. And that's for recognition and prosperity of quality of health and living a future for our generations yet to come. My bucket list, my wish list as a former band counselor is that we need to groom within our own people to address these issues that's been identified, but we're all related. We are. But when we talked about the residential school, I too was abused and raped in that school. But to survive and to forgive is an act of kindness to myself. I need, <clears throat> I need to live a longer life. But we need to do that with our peoples. So we had this big move, movement recently about the truth and reconciliation, but that needs to come back at home because we've lost those gifts within our own people. Transparency, I talked about, that needs to be ignited and needs to be honored. As well, more directions and discussions within our own communities on band membership in today's current affairs because there is lack of consultations from our leadership and with the band members in our reserves. We are the ones who are the decision makers. Well, back in the old days, there were, there were council of elders. It was the people who had spoke to make these decisions. But we need to reclaim that back as people. And I really emphasize in empowering our people to be able to speak up more constructively and more of united front in our reserve lands to be able to challenge the systems that are not working at this time for our peoples. This is why when we see in the prisons, the outcomes are when I just got back from Lethbridge Remand Center, we are noticing a significant growth of younger Aboriginal sectors of people in prison, especially young women who has been committing violent crimes such as homicides and murders. As my contact, the Native Liaison and others with Bowdoin and the Reman up here had indicated what is going on with our peoples, why are we angry? So I could only enlighten you from the grassroots movement of the struggles that we too have to be able to, to work together and collectively find some sense of peace and harmony. But without that, we need to understand what harmony means in a community. But right now, harmony is getting a good check. It's taken our spirit and our community away, and many other communities as well. But with your voices and with your understanding, and I thank the mayor here to delegate and proclaim it's a year of truth and reconciliation here in Edmonton. I honor and I appreciate this, ma'am, because we need to understand each other. 
before we can move on. Right now, our circle of solidarity as walks of life is fractured. It's like the circle of life. We need to mend that fracture by coming together in some kind of gathering to be able to show, be it, with Occupy, I don't know more, whoever, disabilities. We need to collectively come together and signify that we are here. But that creates hope. So as I stand for you as a long time and marginalized and labeled and stereotyped as somebody who survived and living with HIV for over 25 years, don't tell me that there is no hope. I stand for my rights as a human being, but most of all, I'm here to stand for the rights of our people who have been discriminated within our own backyards. So it's time, and it's time to move on. But like this lady had once said in closing, we are trying to do a much better job of getting the word out, but I believe in all the goodness of Canadians, we can make this journey to carry on. So I thank you for your time. I hope you understand a little bit about what our challenges are. So I'm really honored, and I wish you well. Hi, hi. Round of applause for all of our panel speakers. Okay, so we'll be having a panel discussion now. So if anyone had any questions for any of the speakers, uh, please uh, share them. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. My name is Matt Walker. I work with uh, Occupy. And uh, Helen McFadden, you said that uh, in, the, in the charter that equality is protected. And that I, I don't think it is that protected. The same words, uh, equality, before the law were in the American Constitution, which allowed a century of slavery and another century or two of, <coughs> of uh, inequality. So I, I think we have to demand that our governments apply equality. There are only two parties that are committed to equality. That's the NDP and the Green Party. And the, the other parties are, are fine with inequality and they thrive on it. And my, my question is, why should there be equality? Why, why should we want things to be equal? Uh, why do we demand it? Why is there a right to it? And uh, I'm interested in, in the panelists' opinion on that. I, and I would just throw out that the reason, from my mind, why it's necessary is that no one is responsible for who they are, really. Marilyn pointed out the randomness of of our birth and our circumstances, and and when you apply that uh, analytically, then no one is responsible for where they ended up in the world or how they are or, or any of it. And to me, it's, it, that's what makes it such a huge injustice: is that uh, the rich are just lucky, and it's not the poorest fault. And, and we have to demand that equality be applied to rectify that. Um, well, I'm not. <laughs> As I heard the question, uh, your com well, it was more a comment on um, why is there inequality, and, and you did mention that the Charter of Human Rights and Freedom is is uh, certainly an, not a, a, a very strong um, supportive document. We have, like I, I think I mentioned, the patchwork of legislations. I think we need not only like special interest groups, you know, vying to protect uh, their own kind of uh, part of the world, we, we need unity, as uh, my last colleague suggested, together. It, you know, when we continue to see people as, in, in a way that, as others, um, it, the struggle is to, to identify that we have a moral, yeah, we have a moral responsibility to, uh, to be with others at the, at the same level. You know, we have a responsibility to ensure that people are protected if they are vulnerable. Uh, I think w what we need to do is to remove some of that vulnerability. You know, we've created layers and layers that we've got huge populations of vulnerable people now, and that destroys souls. <laughs> it really does. That's, that's incredibly hard on individuals. Um, so, 
is it, what is the answer? I don't know. I mean, part of it is a cohesive like effort, a, a combined effort. Um, I, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I agree there, there are some complex and international issues that have you know, caused this to, to be. Um, part of it is globalization and our propensity to, you know, we have a tendency to be very judgmental now. We are a judgmental society. We use Facebook. It's up or down. We don't have a nuanced discussion about anything anymore. It, we are quick to, to hang our hat in one camp and that's it. So we need more, um, better articulation. We need to also call people to accountability, you know. I've been labeled a bitch in my workplace uh, when I was at the university hospital because, hey, there's no, there's this, these elevators aren't accessible, I noticed, you know, and I complained about that. And hey, I, I'm not even in a wheelchair, but I said, hey, you know, you've got a second, um, this second floor coffee shop that nobody can get to if they're in a wheelchair, what's up with that? You know, and all of a sudden, I'm the troublemaker. Uh, th this is my colleagues, not the, 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 the hospital administration itself. So this is the kind of culture we create. You know, people are so um, protective. And we, nobody likes to be challenged as well. We have to do it in love. Nobody likes to be told, you're an ass. <laughs> you know, you're an ass for, for being oppressive. Well, it's hard to accept this reality. We are all, many of us experience privilege, whether you have the privilege of being a white person or privilege of being a rich person or privilege of being an able-bodied person, we carry that privilege and those assumptions that come along with it. We erode, we take, we strip that away by, by I think, just seeing people one-on-one -on -one and not making assumptions about who they are. I think, I just wanted yeah. to mention as well, the, one of the things that I've learned and discovered that, you know, institutionalism is a real big thing within our peoples as well. You know, what we've identified with the rest school, but also in foster care, but also prisons, but we've suddenly adopted this thing we call internal oppression. Internal oppression has really profoundly hurt a lot of our people, as you may have heard or read. But we've lost that ability to be able to reclaim that. And I think, when, you know, the whole thing about empowering is like, we, we, you know, my suggestion is like, I'm really big on this truth and reconciliation, but it also doesn't mean only with people who's been in the rest school. It means to spend time with this gentleman and talk about and share experiences to regain our, our moral and peer support to be able to get, get those collective voices. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we're going to be in this predicament for quite a while. Could I just add, Mac, uh, one thing about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is I think it, for people, especially you who are old enough to remember the pre-charter days, it's, it's a stronger protective tool than what we had before. And say in the Breen decision, it proved itself actually efficacious in making sure that government doesn't blatantly discriminate in certain ways, like in certain laws. But it's proven very ineffective as a way of getting additional programs or additional benefits. It's been said to be more like a, a shield to protect us from governmental abuses rather than a sword to get us further in the equality struggle. I think you were asking too, if I heard you correctly, why should we insist upon equality? What gives us that right to claim equality? I, I thought you were asking. I mean, I th uh, some of you may be able to give a a more lucid um, answer to that question, but I mean, I think it's a product of the Enlightenment <clears throat> and the end of the medieval times when people were born into certain categories and that that was just tough. And there are still, still places in the world where people are systematically taught that just accept your lot in life, right? And you'll be rewarded if you're lucky in the next life, but, but don't think that, that, that activism or protest or efforts to change your status are gonna get you anywhere, you shouldn't even be trying. But in the democratic part of the <coughs> world, it's another, we've got a completely different um, ideal. The ideal is of moral equality. Uh, I, I think it's a wonderful ideal, we're just not, we haven't succeeded well enough in living up to it. Just That's that what I think. Gentleman, whose hand is up. I'd just like to point out, uh, but I think we have a bit of a problem when it comes to trying to create equality, income equality. Um, I really agree that the only way that we can even out the playing field is by taxing the rich and being able to uh, provide more social, better social programs, especially in education. Um, but the big uh, problem is, 
is this idea of the trickle-down effect. Now, um, I believe that to some degree this is true, that if we try to tax the rich, then they just move off somewhere else where the tax is less. Uh, Bono is a great example of this. He doesn't want to be the fool as the only one that pays extremely exorbitant taxes. So he will move somewhere else, even though he feels that he has an obligation to do more for the poor. He wants to make the decision where his money goes. Well, if we let the rich make those decisions, they don't really make the right decisions, most of them. Uh, so they need to be forced. We need to get that money from them. The problem is we are all playing against one another as society, as a city, as a province, as a country. We're competing for the rich to come here and provide work for us. So we have to reduce taxes in order to get them to come here and do it and provide the jobs that the middle class and the lower classes need. So we are playing against one another. This is the biggest issue and the biggest obstacle, I find, to trying to equal out or tax more from the rich so that we can equal things out more. So I think the biggest obstacle is the lack uh, or the, this playing against one another that we do. I think that it, the only way to get around this is if we work in a global manner that everybody is equally saying we will not let this happen. We cannot allow this area or this area to lower taxes because if they do, then everybody goes there and all the jobs are created there. If we do not all stand up as an entirely big middle and lower class group of the 99% and say, we will not provide, we will not allow this country or that country, we will sanction you, we will go to war if we have to, we will do whatever it takes to make sure that we have an equal and strong taxation system throughout the world. If we do not do that, I don't see how this can work. Anyway, uh, do you agree? I'm only looking for agreement. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, absolutely. I think um, one of the biggest challenges here is that uh, not just us, but people around the world over the last 40 years have either been voluntarily sold or uh, had forced on them an economic system which says the way we draw people in, the way we draw money in, which appears to be the be-all and end-all, is by telling people you'll have to pay less taxes, you'll have fewer labor regulations, you'll have a lower minimum wage, you'll have fewer environmental regulations, and somehow we've decided that that's what creates wealth in a society. And what the research is showing, and we just need to turn this stupid thing on its head, what the research is showing is that what actually benefits the wealthy or everybody more is to have a healthy society, an educated society, a democratically active society, a socially cohesive society. And that comes from the opposite of reducing taxes and regulations. That actually comes by all of us coming together and agreeing on it. And you're right that we can't do it arbitrarily. Some countries have done way better than others. If you look at countries like Norway, where they've actually made some progress in doing these things despite what everybody else in the world is doing. So, there's some possibility, but you're right. I mean, there, there needs to be some collective accountability here, yeah, and internationally. It doesn't work right across the board. It's, it's, if, if we try to tax the rich here, they just go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It can't work in an individual society. But, but there's a terrible, uh, I think there's a terrible pessimism now, too, which, which uh, fuels a lot of things. I mean, you know, some people really believe we're in a kind of an apocalyptic time. The planet is so screwed that why bother, you know, that things are like a runaway locomotive, that we can't turn this puppy around. And, and I think that pessimism is really, really defeating a lot of people who were once active or, or more active. So we have to harness that back again somehow. Uh, did you see the last time I checked, every infant who was born is born naked. So we're all equal at that moment. Having money and throwing money around doesn't do anything. I know a very great population of multimillionaires who are stupid. They're born into wealth. That does not make you brilliant. Each of us have our own capabilities and our own gifts. You can go really far and no money at all. There are a lot of people who make a career out of it. But if you're determined to be self-sufficient and to work hard, all the rewards of hard work are yours. I'm Russian, I'm Russian and Ukrainian. 
and they've been fighting for 450 years, and it seems to be such a problem. It's not a problem for the Russian mother, Ukrainian mother. Are they going to shoot and kill each other? We have a madman over there. And for 22 years, we had people in democracy who could have helped the situation. My question is, why is it that people in my own family have to spend their own personal money in order to fight this? But like I say, we're all together. We're all cousins. Like I'm your cousin. Because our people walked over to America and sold you people first. We live a long time. You've got to shoot us to get rid of us. Because we are very healthy and we have the longevity gene. I'm a part of that. I've worked in activism. I have four degrees that I earned and worked, and I was sending money home to Canada to my parents because they were brought up with green re re recession. Re <coughs> I will say Canada has always provided for those who are minorities, who have been killed, who have been jeopardized. No matter what inhumane thing has happened to your family, there will be at least one who will survive. It is the nurturing that you get, not the money you get thrown at you, that will make you survive as a child. A village makes a child, and now that I am no longer paid by anybody or anything, and I came back to Canada to find out I, it was, I had worked and there was nothing there for, from 1962 to 67, my pension Canada is, I have one check that comes at $7.67. That did not stop me. I came back here not for the weather. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying, what happened to Canada? You've become a third world country. Now I have to change it, and I will, and I have. But I am shocked that those of us who have the opportunity and the family connection, not the money, because most of us haven't. If we're Canadian, we have got nothing. We might have the land. Some of us might even have mineral resources. But in Alberta, we're the only place now in the world, and believe me, I've studied it, that has anything at all going for it. And uh, it's up to us to take a leadership position. We have to work hard and show the world. No other country in the world has anything at all. And my homeboy, and we're originally from Calgary, is Stephen Harper. And I'm not above calling him directly. And I really don't care if he doesn't know me. He will know me. <laughs> and he has. Because I said, oh my god, are we stupid or what? <laughs> so the injustices are every day. If you have a mother and you don't have a father, I'm sorry. I will help you. I'm the great mother. I don't have any children because I'm helping all the screaming mothers and children. And I have, and I will. Whatever it takes. I can work 18 to 24 hours a day. I don't even need to sleep. I'm retired now, and I'm working hard and poor. Nobody's paying me, believe me. But I'm still working here because there are tremendous injustices right here in this town. And I, for a person, am shocked that in my absence, Canada would go right down the drain and let people grovel and sleep out in the River Valley. I mean, I find that shocking. I really do. So if you want to work with me, fine. If you don't, I'll do it myself. Like I say, I don't sleep. And work has its own reward, whether they pay you or not. So I'm proud to call you my cousin. And I am working with the Native groups. And believe me, they have separate problems. And many groups have been persecuted. And many have been discriminated, and even in our family. We had to anglicize our name because it's not factual in Alberta to have a non-English name, and it's still true today. You don't get jobs. Okay, thank you for your comment. We just have a couple more questions to get through. Um, actually, there's a gentleman in the back, and then uh, this gentleman in the t-shirt, and then, yeah. My name is Nick. I'm a retired registered nurse. I worked 35 years for the citizens of Alberta. And uh, I think maybe it's a, just a little wrong-headed uh, to see this as a a slowly progressive disease uh, without recognizing the progress that we have made. And I can offer you a, a brief history. Uh, from 75 to 79, I worked uh, just behind the CN Tower at the single men's hostel. It was a government hostel. At that point, single men weren't eligible for welfare in this province. It wasn't until the early 80s that uh, programs like H were instituted. Um, now they've grown, uh, according to uh, a comment made at Linda Duncan's forum recently, uh, somebody uh, that's on a shared income for the severely handicapped 
is uh, eligible for $1,800. So we've gone all the way from uh, a 20 inch cot and three meals and uh, uh, a voucher for work clothing if you can prove that you have a job. We've gone from that and, and most of the people at the single men's hospital were disabled in one way or another. Uh, and we've come to a point where, where uh, a person can be now apparently the uh, it could take nine months, uh, a year to uh, access uh, Asia. But uh, it's accessible and it is a program and so some progress has been made. Uh, so I don't think it's uh, necessarily helpful to, to represent it as uh, just a steady progressive deterioration. Uh, now of course since 2008 there was a a, a giant cleavage and, and uh, there's been an acceleration of the gap between the rich and the poor, that's obvious. Mm -hmm. I'm living uh, below the poverty line myself now and of course I'm connected with that uh, reality. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, provide um, day to day um, protection I guess you know rent payment and so forth for most for many people in this country who have disabilities I guess the the, pro the problem is that these programs were never really intended to be a permanent solution these were to they're, these are supposed to be transitory kind of uh, solutions and I think we have to distinguish between a person with a disability who is um, you know, there's, there's such a, a scope of people and circumstances. The reality is that so many of people on disability assistance programs across this country are very able to work if they had training supports, if they had, uh, if they're, and all the other kinds of instances I talked about uh, in terms of accessibility, in terms of accommodation in workplaces and education, if all those kinds of things fell in line, <laughs> I would say the vast majority of people on disability assistance would not be there and that would free up a heck of a pot of money to, uh, for, the, for our social safety net. Um, I, you know, I, we have a great program now that's uh, just, sh I, uh, the person over the last, the last question reminded me that, it reminded me that um, uh, there's a great initiative on homelessness and there's all kinds of programs slotting people who have been homeless, you know, trans, trans, transitioning into public housing. I live in public housing in the, in the inner city and I gotta say that it, when people, when well-meaning people design these programs and put Ill, people who are ill-equipped to live in a, you know, in a particular housing project or whatever, it makes it very difficult. You can't just throw money at a situation and expect it to resolve it. These, are, these, are, these people have no life skills. They don't know how to cook or shop or budget. Uh, they still have addictions. They still have social problems and you know, problems with violence. So it creates a really volatile uh, atmosphere in my neighborhood, let me tell you. you know, and then we've got, you know, we've got the, the kind of uh, affluent, well-meaning people fighting for poverty saying, oh, we did such a good job, we're getting people off the street. Well, yeah, but you know, it's not quite there yet. So we can't blanket uh, all these success models uh, with, and, and, and say we've done our job. AISH provides a, a, a reasonable and good alter, alternative to employment because there is no employment for people with disabilities at this point because there's too many other things missing. That's all I, I'd like to say about that. Could I just add, um, there's been uh, maybe one or two comments to the effect that we can't do much at home until the world's problems are solved. There's also a tone to, we don't need government uh, to do anything, there are other solutions. And in fact, I'll, I'll just make this observation that one of the problems I think that socially progressive people have in Alberta is, is, is this. There are lots of socially progressive people. There are lots of people who care about one issue or another, be it disabilities, be it women, be it seniors, you name it, right? But they fail to make the connection to politics, they'll still go out, and if they vote at all, they go out and they vote PC one more time, right? Like there's a huge disconnect. And I, so I just wanna make the observation that some of the critical social problems that we see in Alberta and other parts of our country are due, and this is demonstrated through the research, 
They are due to policy steps that were taken. The, the, the growth in homelessness, the late 90s and into the 2000s, is due in large part to the fact that the federal government cut back on the money it was putting into subsidized housing. That's de demonstrated. Careful research demonstrates this. I agree. It's not always a solution to just throw money at a problem, but if you actually don't have housing where we used to have housing, you could reverse that kind of policy step. And to put it at an even broader level, people point to about 1980 as being the peak of the welfare um, state, the benefits, the generosity of the welfare state in the western part of the world. And once Thatcherism and Reaganism started to uh, go into action and have their effect, that's when we started to see the drop off. So it's not coincidental that then in the 90s you see the Canadian government pulling back. So it's a, it's a plea for politics. It's a plea for taking political engagement seriously. I hope you come the direction of the Greens, but that's not the point. The point is that politics matters. Government matters, and it matters at the provincial level as well as other levels. Uh, Thank you. So we have two questions here, and then I think we might be breaking up into our small group discussions. So just have a question. Ricardo mentioned the two factors involved in sort of alleviating the uh, imbalance in wages in terms of taxation or social program. But what the one thing that can actually significantly ra raise people's wages in the first place are effective unions. You know, it was largely the rise of unions in the 20th century that led to the creation of the middle class in the first place in North America. And it's you know, paralleled the de decline of unionism has paralleled the decline of the middle, middle class. So instead of having you know, the, the litany of anti-union legislation that we have here in places like Wisconsin and basically throughout the Western world, we need, well, we need our governments that are pro-union that will work to increase the education <coughs> We want to actually increase wages and living standards for workers in general you know, to begin with even be before the taxation or the social programs. Yeah, um, absolutely. The one, one of the biggest uh, drivers, and I don't, I did never meant that to imply that those were the only two drivers of inequality. Uh, there's a whole litany and for sure uh, unionization rates are, are a significant, significant factor in inequality. Uh, it's a chicken and egg type thing. Higher unionization rates help reduce inequality. Societies with reduced inequality have higher unionization rates and it cuts both ways. So um, that's a critical one. At the same time, just following up on, on the comments to get political, uh, it's not enough to be unionized, but those unions need to be social unions. They need to be involved in their society. They need to participate. Uh, actively in, in all aspects of society and not just focus on um, workers' wages because what tends to happen then is the, the kind of uh, singular focus on workers' wages actually <coughs> elevates uh, those workers' wages to a point where they're not engaged anywhere else and it becomes about protecting status and privilege rather than contributing to a healthier society. <laughs> Did you want to ask me? Yes, uh, well, uh, my question actually relates to the uh, guaranteed annual income, uh, which is uh, something that uh, at one time actually uh, political parties uh, in this country seemed very interested in. And in fact, the NDP government in Manitoba uh, in the 1970s, with money from the uh, Trudeau government, did a, uh, a research uh, in the, uh, partly in Winnipeg, but particularly in the town of Dauphin, where everybody was put on the guaranteed uh, annual income. It was far too low. But it had tremendous results. Even just uh, the fact that the money was available resulted in more people uh, staying in school longer, fewer people uh, ne needing uh, uh, mental health uh, uh, help, physical health help as well. So, um, and Canada Without Poverty has certainly pushed this idea of you know, uh, the negative income tax as part of the progressive income tax. So I just wondered, I'd, I'd like comments from the, uh, the, the people who uh, yeah, were part of this panel about that as a kind of political demand that, in a sense, that the left could revive. Here, here. Thank you, Alvin. I mean, I don't think that you did this just so I could, I could say what I forgot to say <laughs> in my no, presentation. Yeah, but um, 
Uh, I mean, Greens are going to be debating. We've got two uh, measures, uh, policy motions on guaranteed annual income coming before our AGM next weekend. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a question. So there's, there's general support for guaranteed <coughs> annual income, but it's quite like whether to do it instantaneously or whether to do another dolphin study or, you know, we'll see how that comes out. But that's, um, that's, that's something that uh, most people I know who've thought about this for a while think has to be, has to be the way to go. Um, and I'll also say that, you know, we used to have a progressive income tax in Alberta. We have progressive income tax, not progressive enough at the federal level in Canada. Mm -hmm. And most Canadians don't take off for the Barbados or Bermuda. They're not going to. Some people are, but um, we need that too. And that is Green, poly, uh, green Party policy yeah. is that we would reinstitute, we would reinstate progressive taxation at mm -hmm. the provincial level, which is the only one, only income tax that we could have impact on at the provincial level. Mm -hmm. what, what the guaranteed income does is um, because <coughs> everybody has access to it, everybody has the ability to access it, um, it reduces the stigma that has been built in by policymakers into so many of these other social yeah. programs that mm -hmm. exist. And uh, you combine a guaranteed annual income mm -hmm with fully funded public services that don't require user fees or service payments or membership fees or any of that, and you're on the right track, right? Because uh, you're getting rid of stigma, you're, you're creating a unifying function as, as small c citizens um, that, that uh, you're, you're improving democracy, you're improving distribution. I mean, I think it's, it's definitely something to... Mm -hmm. Plus a little minimum wage so that yeah. employers yes. aren't passing the cost on to the exactly. state. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much for all your questions. Um, okay, can you just a, a word from the food committee? <laughs> uh, one of one of the things that I do as personal choice to support the poor is if I can get my hands on a juice box or a can or a water bottle, I collect them all, cash them in, and donate that money to the food bank. So, please don't throw away your juice boxes. Drink up, drink up. And uh, the, the deposit fee will go to help people who um, can't stretch, can't stretch their budget. Um, and Stuart has recycled, in a very conscientious way, our uh, food ticket jar in order to um, accept any donations like this event is free and all the food is free but if you want to lighten the load before you leave you might uh, be one loony lighter when you leave and um, this will be on the table so if you have a plate those are washable and I take them home and use them again and uh, a juice box please leave it on one of the tables before uh, you go and finish up the food that's all from the food committee. Hey, thank you. Uh, so I think Terry's going to just take over. I just want to like to say something. I am very pleased to be here today. It is very sad that I find so many panelists, all of them very <laughs> knowledgeable, and uh, they understand each other. And I think some of us, even those who ask questions, uh, they, the, the questions seem to come from within. So, as a word of encouragement, I think this is a, one of the most important things that we have these days. <coughs> because of uh, what you said just now, that uh, you know, it's, it's horrible, uh, we are yeah. going down here. So, uh, I thank you, all of you, and I th thank those who are, who are here, and, I, and above all to thank I don't know more for this, uh, and yeah, everything. I encourage you. Uh, it's. Okay, so to close off our afternoon, we had a little exercise plan. Um, there are four corners of this room. They're all set up with a sheet of paper and an information booklet, as well as a question. Um, so what we're going to do is have you just sort of divide yourselves, go to whichever question sounds interesting to you, and then you'll have a number of minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, to talk about the question, 
and then you can present it to the rest of the group at the end. Um, so these are the questions. Uh, they will be listed at each table too if you forget. Okay, question one. On April 22nd, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives released a study showing that Edmonton is the worst city in Canada to be a woman, based on several factors, including income inequality. What steps can be taken to make Edmonton a more equi equitable place for women? And what corner will that one be at? Question one is right there in that corner. Yep. Question two. The City of Edmonton reports over 2,000 homeless people within Edmonton, including those with jobs, those without jobs, and six, or children 16 and under. Knowing these demographics, how can we reduce homelessness in Edmonton? Where's that one? That corner right there. <laughs> question two. Um, there's no question three. Uh, question three wasn't very good, we threw it out. <laughs> uh, so, we're gonna go with question four instead, and question four is right there. Um, people with low incomes face disproportionate barriers to the maintenance of their health and mental health. According to the Urban Public Health Network, major policies, example, those guiding income and consumption taxation and social programs, are effective but not sufficient for addressing local health disparities. What are some ways health and income are related, and what can be done to address these health discrepancies? Question five. Right over there. Uh, the temporary foreign workers program has resulted in decreased wages and unfair treatment of migrant workers. In what ways can we address income inequality while protecting the rights of both Canadians and migrant workers? And... Uh, oh yeah, and the donation thing is going around, so if people haven't gotten it yet, um, I guess we'll be... Should we look for it, Stuart? Well, we'll, we'll put it right by the food table, so if you want to get some food on the way up.